There's just so many card games out there that I did it again. Seven more indie TCGs in seven days. I'm gonna show off some games, go through their mechanics, and then tell you what I think about them. There's been a lot that's happened in this space since the first one too. Scams, delays, broken games. Let's see how these new ones fare, starting with we're gonna start this list off with one of the least traditional card game games out there, Zoo Tiles. In Zoo Tiles, you will be playing animal waifus to a grid in an attempt to make matching squares of friendship, gaining points whenever you do. You can also beat up your opponent's animal waifus and get points off your victories over them. The first one to 12 points wins. The game might seem a little complicated looking at a tile, but it's actually pretty simple. Every animal has some other animal symbols on it. Those are the animals that this one likes. When there's a square of animals that all like each other, except diagonally. Diagonals are lies and they don't exist in this game. Then the player that completed the square of happiness gets all the tiles as points. Animals also have two stats. Those are for combat and uh, I'll get back to that. During a turn of zoo tiles, you can do a bunch of things. The first one being play a tile. It could be a character, it could be an obstacle. You only get one though, and you have to put it by an existing neighboring tile, but not diagonally because that's not real. Obviously, if it's the first tile, you can put it wherever you want. Why would you put it there? Another thing you can do during your turn is start an action stack. This starts by you declaring that you're going to use a certain action tile and putting that tile off to the side. You do not have to say what the target of this action is, only that you are playing it. Then the other player has a chance to react with it with a reaction card. If they do, the reaction card literally goes on top of the original action, and like the original action, no targets need to be specified. This goes back and forth between players until there's no more reactions. At that point, the action stack is resolved from the top to the bottom of the stack. It's like the stack from Magic, but literally a stack. You can start up to two stacks per turn. The next available option is that you can discard two tiles and draw one. Sometimes you look at your hand and you're just like, dog. So you dis Discard them so you can draw not dog. The final action you can take during your turn is to start combat. You do this by declaring the attacker, the defender, which has to be a neighboring tile, and putting any tile from your hand face down to the side to signify the start of the attack. In order to win combat, you need to be stronger and smarter than your opponent, so both stats must be greater. Your attacker and defender aren't alone though. Any tile that's neighboring the defending tile can help attack or defend it, which just adds the supporting tile stats to the main tile stats. The act of starting a combat also starts a stack where you and your opponent can play reactions back and forth. The winner of the combat captures the main tile and adds it to their point total. If neither player is both stronger and smarter, then nothing happens like my original example here. Good job, me. And that's all the things you can do in a turn of zoo tiles. You can do however many of the five things in whatever order you want. Once you're done with your turn, you draw one. Unless. If you do nothing on your turn, you draw two instead. And that's the game. Usually I just summarize most of the rules, but I think here I literally have explained the entire game. So what did I think about it? This game is really simple to learn, but it's actually pretty deep. The decision making is really high. Just playing tiles to make a square never works because your opponent will always get to play the last square and get all the points. So you'll need to trick your opponent into a position where maybe you can have a horse kick a dog into a spot that makes a complete square when they thought you were doing something else entirely. The fact that you don't declare targets when you play actions or reactions is really interesting. It leaves the other player to try and figure out what your master plan is. Having do nothing being a viable action is also pretty cool where you get to draw more cards. In that case, you get to see what your opponent's doing and you're not completely losing out. I did have an instance though where I think both of us were playing not very good and the game became very exhausting and sloggy as a result of bad plays, but not enough to where my opponent didn't want to play again. I also don't think the animal waifu theme is my jam at all, but if that's the worst thing I got to say, then pfft. This game looks pretty solid. So far they have two starter sets out and they just recently-ish had a Kickstarter that almost made $60,000 to tie into the Fruits Basket anime. Hey, they even took out the animal waifus, they just animals. Problem solved, baby. Good way to start off the list. Let's see what the next game holds.
Rift is your usual creature battling, spell slinging, life point destroying card game where you take the other person down from 300 life points to zero. This game more uses Yu-Gi-Oh as a basis instead of magic though. The main unique mechanic of this game is called connection. The monsters or beings in this game often have special effects if they are connected. Connected to what? A type of card called a matrix, which is very similar to equip cards in other games. You connect a matrix to a dude and he has a new ability. Matrices don't die with their wielder though. They stay on the board until something gives them a good whack. The other more unique mechanics of the game are the resource system and the being levels. The resource of the game is called synergy and you get a flat 5 per turn. However, if you have one synergy left and you really want to play this 3 cost card in your hand, you can. This is called over synergizing. It comes at a cost though. The amount you over synergize will be given to your opponent at the start of their turn, so they'll have 7 instead of 5. This lets you get out that one last card if you need it. Sometimes you don't need to pay any synergy at all though. Beings come in different forms. Basic, Advanced, and Max. You can always pay their synergy cost to play them, but for advanced and max beings, you can instead send beings from your field to the void to play them for free! Every advanced and max being has their own free play condition though. Some of them need a specific being, some of them need a type of being, some of them need a connected being, some of them need an eye beam. In the game, there's only really two phases, the play stuff phase and the bonk stuff phase. During the play stuff phase, you can play as many beings as you can afford, along with any code cards. Code cards are kind of a blanket term for everything that isn't a being. The matrices are code cards that act like equipment, the active code cards are basically spells, and then there's delayed code cards which act like trap cards which you can activate on any turn after the turn they're set. Even your opponent's turn! The delayed code cards always cost two and you pay for them when you put them face down. You can also pay 2 to put an active code card face down and then use it later for free regardless of how much it would normally cost. Once you're done playing things, it's time for battle. There's no summoning sickness so all of your goons can launch an all out assault on your opponent's board, except for the first turn where you can't attack. You can only attack your opponent's life points directly if they have an empty board, or if you have the right keyword. When you attack an enemy being, your being's attack is subtracted from the defending being's health. The defender does not retaliate, and health is persistent through turns, so you're gonna have to find a way to track it. Time to bring back the stack of rule books. If you destroy an enemy being, any difference between the defender's remaining health and the attacker's attack is taken from the opponent's life points, so everything has trample piercing penetrate. After you're done attacking, that's all folks, now your opponent gets to make their moves. And likewise, that's about all the mechanics of this game. Now what do I think? Rift is a very swingy game. The main loop in all three different versions I've played involves you building a board, and wiping your opponent's entire board in one turn. Then they wipe your board, and then you wipe their board, and there's so much wiping that you've cleaned the board to a mirror sheen. Swing. The more times you can't clear the board, the more incremental loss you accumulate and you eventually lose. This also means you never really want to make the first move in the game because you can't attack on the first turn. So you usually play a basic being that searches something from your deck, maybe lay down a trap card, and pass. I even had a few games where several turns went by and no one wanted to commit because he who commits first, dies first. The way the being stats are set up doesn't really help either. Most of the advanced beings can easily take out basic beings. Their booties are just never big enough to withstand a single advanced pounding. This puts the basics in a weird spot where most of the time I feel like I only want to play the ones that immediately gain me some kind of advantage because they probably aren't sticking around. There's also a few cards that are just wildly strong. In a game where the board gets wiped so often, this missed target card is going to be a game changer because it basically basically just cancels an attack. This little book gives anything double attack, which is pretty strong. Over synergizing as a mechanic, I think is in kind of a weird spot because of how the rest of the game plays out. Sure, I'll give my opponent an extra resource or three if that means they start the turn with a board of nothing. You just really don't end up caring about it. Overall, I feel like the game is a little undercooked for where it seems to be at in production. It's been canceled on Kickstarter twice at this point and also has had one other pre-order type attempt. It just doesn't seem like the game has found it itself yet, but I hope it does, because the concept is pretty neat, some of the art is nice, and the creator has been pretty cool every time I've interacted with him. Next game. In Academy of Arts, you take control of a magical wizard that summons creatures and throws spells to take the opposing wizard down to zero HP. Every wizard character has their own HP, special ability, and initiative stat, which is a resource that refills every turn that lets you play instant type effects. 
As far as your regular resource, the first turn you start with one mana, then the next turn you have two mana, then three mana, and you know it's a pretty common system for digital card games. You can use mana to play summons which can attack the enemy player, artifacts which chill on the board for a certain number of turns while doing things, spells, and alterations, the equip type cards. However, on turn five you get the choice to start generating light or dark mana instead of the regular stuff, which some cards need in order to be played. So if you choose dark mana, you'll have four neutral mana and one dark mana. You don't have to choose on turn 5, but once you choose light or dark, you can't choose the other one later. You can also just continue to make neutral mana, or I call it Switzerland mana. I don't actually call it that, this is a terrible- Every turn in Academy of Arts lets both players play cards. One player is the attacker on a turn, and the other one is the defender. First, the attacker gets to play cards, then the defender gets to play cards, then the attacker gets to attack. When you attack, the attacker declares a summon that's going to attack and puts them forward to the leftmost side of the board. Then, the defender can either put one of their summons to defend or use a reaction card, which costs a certain amount of your initiative points. Don't worry, they come back next turn. After that, both players can play reactions back and forth until they've decided enough is enough, but nothing resolves yet. Then, the attacker can declare another attack and put it next to the last attacker, and the whole thing starts over again. Once no more attacks are declared, the chain as it's called, starts to resolve from the first attacker down the line. Any reactions will be resolved in reverse order to the order they were played. It's like the stack mechanic from most other games, but every attack and block is like its own little mini stack. It's a stack on a chain. Oh no! When a summon is blocked by another summon, they both deal their strength to each other, and damage is persistent, so you gotta find a way to track that. Once combat has completely resolved, the turn ends and the defender attacker rolls switch players. And that's pretty much the game. What's it like? The game is really close to Legends of Runeterra, but definitely has some key differences. One of them being the way combat works, like a weird combination of the declare all attackers at one system like magic and the declare and resolve attacks individually system that something like Duel Masters or Force of Will uses. Attacks being declared individually, but only resolving after all attacks, defenders, and instants are declared is something that I don't think I've ever seen before. If the instants weren't fairly limited, I could see it being hard to remember the order that everything is played but there are never more than like two instants in the games that I played. I like that the characters all have abilities that regularly get used throughout the game. Picking your wizard definitely impacts the game plan you're trying to make. I think this game requires a few too many trackers though. You either need two or four dice to track mana depending on whether you start making light or dark mana. Some cards have counters that need to be tracked, then you throw in some damage counters and some status effects that you need to track, not to mention the life tracker that you'll need for your wise art and your initiative. Finally, I think instants being tied to their own resource that refills every turn might make control decks a bit too strong, or at least it seems like a spooky design that could get scary in the future, because they use all their mana to play cards, and then they can use initiative to play instants too. If you make the good instants too cheap, the control characters will machine gun them out forever. Too expensive and the aggro characters can just never play them in the first place. Actually, maybe that's not a bad choice. I don't know. Overall, I think Academy of Arts is a pretty decent theme, very pretty card cards and competent gameplay, but it doesn't really hit me with any of that kind of wow factor. Nothing that makes me go, wow, that's crazy, bro. So get out of here. We're going to the next game. Next up, we got Varia, a fighting style card game that isn't a TCG, haha, <laughs> I tricked you, where you play as a class of warrior fighting another until the life points hit zero. You have a deck of attack cards and defense cards along with equipment cards that start off on the board. Character card? Nah, you're the character mother bleeper, you're not playing one, you is one. Or at least that's what their marketing tells me. So in that case, I am the volcanic warrior. The rest of the board is split into a bunch of vertical columns called moments. In a turn, one player acts as the attacker and the other as the defender. I'm not gonna do that. The attacker will play action cards one per moment, basically deciding the moves that they want to do this turn using cards from their hands or equipment assets. Then their opponent gets to play responses in each moment. They could play block cards, which are better at mitigating damage, or you could just meet their attack head on with another attack, the Volcanic Warrior's Way. The defender can't play cards in new moments though. The attack 
attacker gets to decide how many total moments there are, and that's that. Once all the acting and reacting is done, there is a round of fast actions where you can do things that say they're fast. Maybe you add a boost to one of your attacks in a c-c-c-combo, or maybe you swap out a card altogether. Fast actions can do that. It's called action replacement. So the attacker gets to be fast, and then the defender gets to be fast, and they go back and forth until neither player wants to be fast anymore. But then what? You haven't described any sort of resource system? I'm totally lost! Well, now we're going to resolve the moments. Each moment almost resolves like its own little turn, except you don't get to play anything. First, both players have to pay for their cards, noted by these little action point pips on the side. You get 10 action points per turn, and if you don't have enough action points to do a move, it'll get pushed down the timeline, and if it pops out of the turn's allotted moments, it'll be the first action performed on the next turn. After that, there's a timing window that some abilities will go off in called the start of moment. Then, the actual combat happens, the final mystery box of the game. In the upper right, there are some numbers, and these are for that good old fighting and once you're fighting it's time to start the rolling yeah this game uses dice too but instead of a pass or fail style system both players will be rolling against each other a d4 for skill and a d6 for strength if an attack is opposed by a block, the attack has to have more skill than the block or else you just miss straight up. So you take your d4 roll and add what it says on the card. Ha! Mighty warrior never miss! Then you take the d6's roll and add it to what it says on the card for your total attack and defense value. If the attack is more than the defense, you deal the difference from your opponent's health. Bang! Puny snow bear, my axe is too hot, just like me. If an attack is opposed by another attack, no need for silly focus, just roll for strength, and the bigger number deals the difference to the other player. After the action has resolved, there is another timing window called end of moment where things can happen. Then you move on to the next moment. Equipment cards don't go to the discard like other cards though, they go back to the equipment zones. Hashtag reusable. Once all the moments are resolved, the attacker and the defender switch. I basically described all of the phases of the game at this point except for one. At the beginning of your turn, you draw two, and then you get to decide on distance for the turn. There are only two distances, engaged and disengaged. If you're disengaged, then all attacks will automatically miss unless they're ranged. And then, after that, you start planning your moments, and that's the game. Hold on, wait a second. Another thing to note is that the main format of the game is just pre-constructed decks. You get a character, and you play them. There is a constructed format and more support coming for it, but the main one right now is just slapping down the death pirate box and shuffling it up. I just thought it would be cool to mention before my opinion, which is now. A lot of card games have tried to be fighting games. You got Mega Man, My Hero, Flesh and Blood, and I think this one does a really good job at nailing the feeling without being too much like the other ones. Since the main game mode right now is pre-constructed decks, you can look into all your play lines and learn the matchups against the other characters. The decks they give you are not just play sets of every card, there's lots of two ofs and one ofs that really make you work with what you're given instead of just being able to do the best thing all the time. And I think I would normally hate this kind of thing in a starter deck type product, but it works for this game. Now let's talk about the dice. TCG players hate dice, but in this game I feel like the dice are a little more acceptable because you are actively rolling against against your opponent to do things, and not just rolling against some arbitrary threshold to do your thing or not. And by the end of most games, you have seen most of your deck, so the dice are one of the driving variance factors of this game. It's just a mystery of what order you will see all of the cards and what combos you will have access to at what time. Most games I played were also pretty close. I also really like the distance system. It adds a cool element of movement without being a bunch of spaces you need to move cards around on. The characters are also very varied in Varia. You got the usual angry strong guy, the holy cleric, the tree druid, but then you got like the gatling gun bearer, the psychic fencer, and the heavy metal bass playing chicken guy. Hell yeah! Overall, I think the game is very unique with a pretty low barrier to entry. It certainly distinguishes itself from other fighting games, and I think at least the starter set is worth trying out. Next game!
Mythic is a mythological themed game that aims to be Yu-Gi-Oh before it got crazy, which could mean several different points depending on who you ask. The mechanics are largely the same as Yu-Gi-Oh. You have 25,000 life points, I mean heartbeats, and you need to get the other person to zero. There's champions, which are your main dudes, they got attack points, defense points, and you can put them in attack mode or defense mode. This game even lets you do the fabled face up defense position. Amazing addition, really. We can now live out our anime dreams. Champions have levels and you've got to pay for them with action points. You get four action points per turn and they just kind of pile up until you spend them. Then there's magic cards which might have to be rebranded to spell cards if they're not careful. They don't cost anything, you just do what they say and either chuck them or they stay on the board if they're enduring. The next card type is the fortifier which you put face down and can be activated on any turn after that, even your opponent's turn. They can also be enduring. A unique type of card for this game is the general. They're free and they're played on their own special spot on the board. You can only play one per turn, but if you want to play another one later, you just chuck the current one in the garbage. Yeah, that's right, Pengus. Get out of here. I want Oda Nobunaga. Hey, wait a second. These are just field spells. Finally, there's Mythics. These go in their own deck on the side and have their own special conditions to play them to the board. Some of them need a specific card to be played. Some of them need you to sacrifice champions until you hit a power threshold. Some of them, some third way to describe how to do it. The turns go as follows. Follows. You draw and gain four action points in the draw phase, then you play all your stuff during the action phase, then you do the battling in the battle phase before heading to the main phase to- There's no main phase two. Once you start swinging, you can't be bringing no more guys to the board. <laughs> when a champion attacks a- uh, Hold on, do I really need to explain Yu-Gi-Oh combat? What's that? To be consistent? Ugh, fine. Only dudes in attack stance can attack. Dudes can attack your opponent's dudes, or if they have no dudes, they can attack your opponent's face. When you attack an attack stance dude, the bigger number wins and deals the difference in the attack to the opponent's heart beast and destroys their dude. Attacking things in defense stance doesn't do this. If your number's bigger, you just swat their dude to the discard pile. If it's not bigger, you take the difference to your heartbeats and nothing is destroyed. Is that good? Yeah, better be. That's the mechanics. It's opinion time. Boy, sure, it's Yu-Gi-Oh. It seems like they're going for a Synchro or Exe area Yu-Gi-Oh, but I'm not sure if it's Yu-Gi-Oh before it got crazy. There's a card in this game that says it destroys without targeting, and man, that's some high-key Yu-Gi-Oh BS right there. The game is extremely fast, and I think out of the six or seven games I played, one time both players bricked, and I think we went to like turn six. The game regularly seems to be wrapping up by turn three, and I don't mean player one's turn three, I mean the third turn of the game. For having such a huge life total, it goes away extremely fast. While I'm on the numbers, the stats in this game are mostly base 1000, meaning that everything is a multiple of a thousand, except for the odd 500 here or there, and I don't understand why they need to be like this. I can understand putting a zero to differentiate the stat number from the cost, but three zeros on everything seems like over overkill. They don't have any other purpose besides number big. I don't really have much else to say about it. If you want to play Yu-Gi-Oh, but not current Yu-Gi-Oh or any of the alternate format Yu-Gi-Ohs out there, then you might want to check out Mythic. This game also has a more than two player mode, but I never played it that way. The game is also post Kickstarter. It's already been long delivered and I don't know what they're doing next. Uh, so... In Rise, you have two summoner characters that have life points. You need to summon creatures, cast spells, and level up your summoners to unlock new abilities so you can take down the opposing two summoners. This game has some very similar bones to magic, but with a few very large differences. The main one being the summoners. Both of your summoners start the game at level one. You can tap them to unlock their capacity points for the turns, which is equal to their level. Capacity points can either be used to play any card, they all cost one, or use one of your summoner's skills, which also cost one point. When you're level one, you only have access to the summoner's first skill, so you must be able to level up, right? Of course, you do that by playing a level up card. Amazing. Once per turn, you can play one of these level up cards on your summoner to level it up and give it access to new abilities and more capacity points, which means playing more cards. For card types, you have the summoners, the levels, then your usual creatures with attack, defense, keywords, effects, they can attack during the attack phase, they can block your opponent's creatures, you know them, you love them, they all cost one in this game. Then you have incantations, your spell type cards. When you play them, you do what they say above the text box, and then they stay on the board indefinitely 
indefinitely, and once per turn you can use the action that is inside the text box. Now most of these will have a cost with a coin next to it. This is your second resource, your stock, where you get more coins every turn. Some cards just have you pay a certain amount of coins to activate the effect. Other cards... Well, other cards make you flip for it. You call a coin. If you flip it right, you get the effect. Woohoo, baby, yeah! If you call it wrong, you get nothing! Unless the card specifically says you get something if you call it wrong. Creatures can also have these cost-based actions, and so can the final card type. Door. Yeah, that's right. Door. Doors can block multiple creatures and get some kind of effect when something opens them. See, now I win the game. Creatures and incantations can also be imminent, which means you can play them at any time like a quick play, instant, flash, what have you spell. Even on your opponent's turn. Those are all the card types. Now let's talk about the turn structure. In the usual turn, you will untap, I mean straighten, all of your tilted cards and regain all of your capacity points. Then you can draw two cards and gain one coin, or draw one card and gain two coins. Then you can tilt your summoners to make points, level them up, use their skills, play dudes, use spells, create door, and so on. Then you move to combat where you declare all of your attacking creatures at once by tilting them, and then your opponent can declare creatures and doors to block your creatures. Then once all the blockers are declared, every Every creature and matching defender do their attack damage to the other's defense points, and if anything hits zero defense points, then... Any unblocked damage goes to the defending player's summoners, and that player can choose how the damage is distributed between them. After combat, the turn passes to the other player. There is no main phase after combat in this game. It seems to be a recurring theme. Unless you want to play some imminent cards, I guess. I guess I also didn't know where to throw this in, but this game also does the thing where every card says how many of it you can play in a deck. It's the rank at the top of the card, and there's also rank infinites, which are usually tokens, but you can have them in your main deck if you want to, and you can have as many copies as you want. And if a rank infinite dies, then it makes this other resource called Ether that some other cards use, and you know what? That's the game. I don't know what I think about this game. It's very pretty, it made a lot of money on Kickstarter, it definitely has people that enjoy the gameplay, but uh, boy, I don't think I'm one of them. I think it's all because of this little thing right here. Having coin flips as a main mechanic just kind of makes me want to push my fingers into my eyes. Doing your effect or getting nothing based off of 50-50 kind of makes me cringe a little bit, honestly. I think the summoners, the resources, and the leveling up is all really cool. They've also taken a very interesting approach to balancing cards where it seems like you'd make a deck that is really good at one specific thing, like taking people's money, or making an army of spooky skeletons, or unlocking doors. This also makes the card design feel very odd to me because everything seems to be either busted or completely useless. I have no idea if I just don't know the balancing access of the game or if there just isn't one. Am I a League of Legends player looking at Dota 2 or is this a seesaw with a chicken on one side and Mecha King Ghidorah on the other? Oh, and the keyword symbol thingies. There are 45 keywords. I'm not joking. Some of them are your basic flying trample kind of thing, but some of them, some of them are like, bomb, this is an explosive. Okay. That only means something in the context of explosive. If a creature that has explosive is equipped with a bomb, it can make a kamikaze attack that will destroy it and another targeted creature on the same plane. It counts as a sacrifice and can be only used in the combat phase. Alright, so they actually did reword this ability. I just thought the joke was too funny to not keep in. They're not even words. They're just symbols that you're just supposed to know. For set one, 45 symbols seems like an absurd amount. There's one that just doesn't do anything yet. Why? So that's Rise. It's so close to being really cool, but the stuff I don't like, I just really don't like. Moving on, last stop, ding ding. The final game I played in this round was Gem Blenders. In this game, each player has a team of four heroes and you'll need to equip them with gems and then use the gems to make more and more powerful blends to knock your opponent to zero life points. Your hero cards are the most important cards. They start off on the board in a formation like this. The left, right, and middle heroes are considered the front line. They can attack the corresponding heroes on the other side of the board. Left to left, right to right, middle to middle. The back hero is the support, which means they don't do anything useless idiot. Once per turn, each hero can make an attack. And when you do, you compare the attacker's health to the defender's defense. Any attack points over the defender's defense get dealt to the defender as damage from a pool of 20 HP. All these guys are wimpy though. We're gonna need to blend some gems together to make these weak sauce heroes battle ready. 
Blends are cards with some number of gems at the top of the card, from two gem weenies to five gem chedacious units. To play these, you're gonna have to equip a hero with the listed gems. Once per turn, you can take a gem from your hand and smack it on a hero, as long as there are less gems on the hero than their level. This guy can only have three gems, so he can't take it. Whenever the hero has the required gems, you can plonk the blend from your hand on top of the hero, and the hero stats become the blend stats. You can also de-blend a hero at any point by simply trashing the blend. When your hero is attacked, you can also de-blend to block any damage you're about to take. If a blend ever loses any of the required gems from their hero, they must also de-blend. Sometimes, heroes also need a gem attached to them to activate their stats or effect, as noted by the diamond in the rar. In addition to gems and blends, your deck also contains action cards that act as spells that let you do things like swap positions of heroes, or grab a blend from your deck, or cancel an effect. Some actions are so strong that they got stars on them, and you can only put six stars worth of actions in your deck. Any more and you'd have to double tribute, and that's just not worth it. Actions are free to play, but you can only play five actions per round, putting them in a little column as they're played. So what's a round? Well, the game doesn't actually end when someone hits zero HP. When this happens, the current player's turn ends immediately, both players get set back up to 20 HP, and then any played actions get chunked into the discard, and the game continues. It's basically a built-in best two of three. Once somebody wins two rounds, that's the end of the game. Other than that, there's the game phases, I guess, which could not be simpler. Draw, do literally anything, attack, use an effect, play a gym, make a mixed drink, do your taxes, it's a free main phase, bruh, and then end phase where you pass it over. That's it. That's the game. Psh. All right, let's get the elephant out of the closet. This game has a very uh, unique art style, and I think it will hurt the game more than anything else. People dookie on MetaZoo's art style, and it's pretty good sometimes. Jeez, what is that? It just really does not inspire joy. Their fancy foil cards, though, look at least three times better. I wish all the cards were just laid out like this. So funny thing, I recorded uh, most of this video last September, and by the time they got to their Kickstarter this year, uh, they do all look like that. They just didn't update Tabletop. Wait, actually, I didn't check, did they? Uh-oh. That's what I get for procrastinating for eight months. The game is pretty enjoyable, though. There's definitely a strategic element of setting up blends, moving your heroes around, moving your opponent's heroes around, moving the table around. All of the heroes and blends have effects, and there's quite a large number of them in the card pool, so the strata gem possibilities are pretty large. On the downside, though, most decks include five different gems, which is playing like a five-color deck in Magic or a five-type deck in Pokemon. Pokemon, I don't know, they still use energy, right? Sometimes you just brick on the gem you need or only draw gems when you need blends or you have the blends for the wrong gems. The old gem flood and gem screw, a classic problem that people can't decide if main deck resources are worth ripping out of games and never looking at them again or are actually integral to a game's success by creating variation. Don't look at me like that. I don't know. The blend system, I think, is a good take on the evolution mechanic. Instead of one specific card evolving into another specific card, like almost every other evolution system type not named Digimon does it, like Digimon, the blend system allows you to create more of a branching pathway than a straight line with the evolutions. If I'm being honest, that's really all I got for gem blenders. It's neat, it's pretty cheap, it's simple, it's kind of hard to look at. And that's it. I played seven games in seven days, and then took like nine months to actually make this video. If you liked any of them, I linked their most relevant website or social in the description. It was another spicy round of contenders, some with very wild ideals on what card games can be like, and some with more familiar ideas with their own twist. If you liked the video, make sure to drop a like or subscribe if you want to see more card game videos like this one. What game should I talk about next? Or maybe I should play one, as I also do gameplay videos. Maybe I should cover the original One Piece card game now that they have the new one out. Or maybe I could be the only man on earth to have a maelstrom tcg gameplay video let me know in them comments i'm two lanes the cardboard crypt keeper also known as card boy and i'm out of here